and welcome to the National Park Service and the Federal Aviation Administration public meeting for the draft air tour management plan for Olympic National Park. I'm Michelle Carter, an environmental protection specialist with the National Park Service, and I'll be your moderator for this evening. I'd like to start off by defining a couple of quick acronyms that you'll hear us use uh, throughout the presentations. You'll hear us refer to the National Park Service as the NPS, the Federal Aviation Administration as FAA, and the Air Tour Management Plans as ATMPs. And we'll define the remaining acronyms as we go along. Next slide, please. We're holding this virtual public meeting to review the draft ATMP for Olympic and to seek public feedback on that draft. This meeting is being held pursuant to the National Parks Air Tour Management Act of 2000, also known as NAPATMA, and its implementing regulations. You're gonna hear a little bit more about NAPATMA and the draft ATMP shortly, along with some more information on how you can submit questions and official comments. But before we dive into the presentations, I'd like to take just a minute and introduce our presenters and provide you with a little bit more information about meeting logistics logistics and how you can participate. Next slide, please. So joining us this evening as presenters are Eric Elmore, Senior Policy Advisor with the FAA, Vicki Ward, Overflights Program Manager with the Natural Sounds and Night Skies Division of the National Park Service, and Sarah Creechbaum, the Superintendent of Olympic National Park. Eric and Vicki are going to give us a brief overview of NAPATMA and the purpose of today's meeting. Then uh, we'll hear from Sarah, who will share information from the park's perspective and discuss park-specific resources along with the draft ATMP. Next slide. Throughout the meeting, we invite you to submit your questions, which we will address after the presentations as part of the Q&A session at the end. And questions submitted through this evening's um, meeting will be considered by the agencies as they continue drafting the ATMP, but they're not actually considered formal comments. Next slide, please. All official comments must be submitted through the National Park Service Planning, Environment, and Public Comment, or Pepsi site, or sent to the mailing addresses listed on that Pepsi site. And I wanted to note that only comments received through one of these two avenues will become part of the official record. The agencies won't be accepting official comment via email. We'll share a little bit more information about this later in the presentation. And I'd like to point out that all formal comments must be submitted on or before August 28th of this year. Next slide, please. Our meeting is being live streamed across Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. If you're watching on one of those platforms, you can submit your questions using the link to a Google form uh, the FAA will post into the chat area of the platform that you're using. And when the time comes, we'll read your question aloud and our presenters will respond. And our team is gonna do the best that we can to get to all of the questions. But in the event we don't get to all of them, we will provide contact information at the end where you can go for post-meeting follow-up. Our meeting is gonna be 90 minutes long and we plan to adjourn at 7 p.m. Pacific time. If we end up getting through the questions early, we'll keep the meeting active until 7 p.m. just in case additional questions come in or, or people end up joining us a little bit late. And please know uh, that this meeting will be recorded. We appreciate you joining us this evening to learn more about Olympics draft ATMP. We're gonna play a short video now before I turn it over to Eric and Vicki to provide additional details about NAPATMA and why we're here today. The United States is home to some of the most breathtaking national parks and tribal lands in the world. It is important that we protect these lands while ensuring that the public has ample opportunity to enjoy these national treasures. Air tours offer the public a totally different type of experience. The Federal Aviation Administration and the National Park Service work together to manage air tours over national parks. We are developing plans that help protect wildlife, wilderness character, cultural resources, 
natural soundscapes, and visitor enjoyment. These plans are known as air tour management plans. And today, we will explore the specifics of the draft plan for your park. As part of our planning process, we consult with tribes, native Hawaiian organizations, state and tribal historic preservation officers, and wildlife biologists. We assess noise, wildlife protection, and other environmental considerations, and we'll continue to make adjustments to these plans as needed. And we consider the appropriate level of National Environmental Policy Act review for these plans. The FAA and the National Park Service are committed to ensuring safe flights at our national parks while safeguarding park resources. Following today's presentation, we encourage you to review your park's draft air tour management plan and provide official comments through the National Park Service Planning, Environment, and Public Comment website. Together, we can celebrate these special places and ensure they can be enjoyed for generations to come. Thank you, Michelle, and welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Eric Elmore, and I'm a senior policy advisor in the Federal Aviation Administration. Uh, today, I'm going to provide you with an overview of the National Parks Air Tour Management Act, as we know as NAPATMA. And my colleague, Vicki Ward, will provide an overview of the Air Tour Management Plans. Next slide, please. So the National Park Air Tour Management Act requires the FAA in cooperation with the National Park Service to develop air tour management plans for those parks and tribal lands where operators have applied to conduct commercial air tours. Uh, with note in 2012, Congress did amend NAPATMA to allow for voluntary agreements as well, but the agencies have decided to prepare an air tour management plan for Olympic. NAPATMA also applies to commercial air tours that are within a half mile of the park, that are over tribal lands within or abutting a park, and have to be within the airspace that is from ground level to 5,000 feet above ground level, or as we call AGL. Next slide, please. Now, NAPATMA does not apply to general aviation, commercial airline, or military flights. The act does not apply to parks in Alaska, the Grand Canyon National Park, or Rocky Mountain National Park. The 2012 amendments also provided for an exception for parks that with 50 or fewer flights they are exempt from developing air tour management plans unless that exemption is withdrawn by the Park Service. At Olympic, there were more than 50 reported flights, so that exception would not apply in this instance. And finally, if an abutting tribal lands are or may be overflown, then the agencies have to invite those tribals uh, those tribes to as cooperating agencies in the National Environmental Policy Act process, NEPA. Next slide, please. Now the act applies to commercial air tour operators and it requires them to apply to FAA for operating authority before they can operate over a national park system unit and abutting tribal land. In general, commercial air tour operators fall into two categories, existing commercial air tour operators at Olympic, which there is one, and new entrant commercial air tour operators. There, we are unaware of any new entrants at this time, but those are the two categories of commercial air tour operators. I think I'm going to hand it over to my colleague Vicki Ward now to provide you with an overview of air tour management plans. Hi, thanks, Eric. Yeah, I'm Vicki Ward. I'm with the Natural Sounds and Night Skies Division in the National Park Service, and I'll continue the overview of NAPATMA. Uh, in the Act, there are some specific requirements for what an air tour management plan uh, is supposed to achieve. And so that objective is to develop 
acceptable and effective measures to mitigate or prevent the significant adverse impacts, if any, resulting from commercial air tour operations upon natural and cultural resources, visitor experiences, and tribal lands. Next slide. The act also specifies what the contents of an air tour management plan need to have. And uh, one of the provisions is it may prohibit commercial air tour operations in whole or in part. It also establishes conditions for the conduct of those air tour operations that would include routes, altitudes, time of day restrictions, uh, restrictions for particular events, such as a tribal ceremony or some other uh, event going on at the park, and maximum number of flights. And this could be on a yearly basis, a daily basis, or some other seasonal uh, time frame. And as mentioned earlier, it applies only to commercial air tour operations, but all commercial air tour operations within a half mile outside the boundary of a national park. Uh, the air tour management plan must include incentives for the adoption of quiet aircraft technology, and it also must provide for the allocations of the air tour operations when the air tour management plan limits those operations. And then each air tour management plan, including the one for Olympic National Park, will justify and document the need for any measures taken uh, pursuant to the items in the act, or I'm sorry, in the plan uh, regarding location of routes, uh, altitudes and other restrictions. And those measures are also included in the record of decision. Next slide. And for those of you who may be calling in and can't see the slide, this is a slide that shows a map of the continental United States and Hawaii. And it shows the locations of the parks where we are doing air tour management plans. We are working on right now uh, plans for 24 parks concurrently. A lot of those parks are uh, in the Western US. Uh, there's two parks in Hawaii, you know, obviously Olympic and Mount Rainier in Washington, and then California, Southern Utah, uh, South Dakota. And then we have a couple parks out east too for Everglades in Great Smokies, and then also the parks around New York Harbor, which includes Statue of Liberty. So um, the list of parks is on the slide if you wanna take a look at that later. Uh, next slide. So for each air tour management plan, the FAA and MPS are publishing the, the draft air tour management plans in the Federal Register and we're holding at least one public meeting for each draft air tour management plan, which is why we're holding this meeting today. Uh, each air tour management plan will comply with the National Environmental Policy Act and other legal requirements, such as the National Historic Preservation Act and Endangered Species Act. And where uh, it applies, we will invite tribes to participate as cooperating, cooperating agencies for National Environmental Policy Act compliance, where those tribal lands are or may be overflown. So as, as we've mentioned previously, the purpose of today's meeting is to review the com components of the draft air tour management plan for Olympic National Park. And then I think with this, I turn it back over to Michelle and Sarah. Thank you. Great. Hey. Thanks, Vicki. Um, yeah, and now we'd like to turn it over to Superintendent Creechbaum to hear more about the park's perspective. Thank you, Michelle. Um, good evening, everybody. I'm Sarah Creechbaum, and I'd like to thank you for being with us this evening. I have the privilege of being the superintendent of Olympic National Park. And I'll be presenting just a brief overview of the park, its resources, and a little bit about the proposed ATMP for Olympic National Park. So let's go to um, the overview slide, please. Righto. Olympic National Park is located in Northwest Washington State, for those of you who don't know, and it forms the heart of the Olympic Peninsula. 
The park was designated by Congress and the act creating it was signed into law on June 29, 1938 by President Franklin Delano Roosevelt. And the park from its conception was always intended to be a wilderness park. Next slide, please. Olympic National Park was created for the purpose of preserving for the benefit, use, and enjoyment of the people, a large park containing the finest sample of primeval forest of Sitka spruce, western hemlock, Douglas fir, and western red cedar in the entire United States. And it was also to provide suitable winter range and permanent protection for the herds of native Roosevelt elk and other wildlife indigenous to the area and to conserve and render available to the people for their inspiration and enjoyment, the Olympic mountains, glaciers, perpetual snow fields, verdant forests, and 78 miles of the most beautiful coastline anywhere. Next slide, please. The park encompasses one of the largest wilderness areas in the contiguous United States. It's 95% of the park in total and about just shy of 900,000 acres is designated wilderness. The Daniel J. Evans Wilderness was established by Congress in 1988 to preserve its largely untrammeled and undeveloped wilderness character. More than 10 million people, believe it or not, live within a five hour drive of Olympic National Park. And the wilderness provides resource and economic benefits that include clean water and natural plants, native plants and wildlife habitat, natural soundscapes, dark night skies, and many opportunities for recreation, inspiration and renewal. The wilderness offers also more than 600 miles of trail and in 2021, believe it or not, so far, we have issued permits for 153,000 camper nights. And if you include the reserve permits through the end of the year, that's 170,000 camper nights, which puts us in the top two or three um, national parks nationwide. Next slide, please. Whoops, I'm sorry. Would you go back one for me, please? Shell, thank you. <laughs> the park is within the homeland and the traditional territory of eight nations. The Macaw tribe, the Quileute tribe, the Ho tribe, the Quinault Indian nation, the Lower Elwha Clallam tribe, the Jamestown Clallam tribe, the Port Gamble Clallam tribe, and the Skokomish tribe. The park contains hundreds of archeological sites as well as historic sites, ethnographic sites, cultural landscapes, and historic districts that document more than 12,000 continuous years of human occupation. The park protects 12 major river basins and more than 3,500 miles of river and streams, more than 300 high mountain lakes, and two large lowland lakes. Consequently, the park is entrusted with the stewardship of numerous unique stocks of Pacific salmonids and other freshwater species, fish species. And salmon are the keystone species of the park's forests and our aquatic ecosystems and are of great importance to our neighboring tribal nations and the region. The park has several important national and international designations, including designation of, uh, by UNESCO as an international biosphere reserve in 1976, inscription on the UNESCO World Heritage List in 1981, and designation of Point of Arches as a national um, this natural landmark in 1971. The park also provides habitat for more than a thousand species of native plants, hundreds of species of birds and 70 species of mammals, including in these numbers are several federal threatened species, such as the Northern, Northern Spotted Owl and the Marbled Murrelet. Plants and animals unique to the Olympic Peninsula are also protected by the park. The peninsula's isolation has led to the existence of more than a dozen endemic plant and animal species found at Olympic National Park and nowhere else on earth. 
Of these species, the Northern Spotted Owl and the Marbled Murrelet are, are likely to be disrupted by loud noises um, that occur in close proximity to an active nest or when activity occurs within the line of sight of the nesting birds. Sound generating activities located uh, within close proximity of occupied nest sites or unsurveyed suitable habitat, that's habitat we haven't, we're not quite sure is um, occupied during the early breeding season or nesting season, they have the potential to adversely affect the murrelets or the northern, northern spotted owls. Marble murrelet nesting season occurs from April 1st to September 15th. And the murrelet habitat is primarily located along or near river corridors where the birds fly from coastal waters to their inland nests to feed their nestlings during the dawn and dusk periods. And we usually um, identify the crepuscular hours as that two hour window before and after dawn and dusk. Next slide, make sure I'm on the right track. Air tours at Olympic National Park have been ongoing for quite some time since um, before the National Park Air Tour Management Act or NAPATMA was passed in 2000. And the act directs the FAA to grant interim operating authority or IOA to air tour operators that were already conducting tours at Olympic National Park um, when the act became effective. And we'll do that until an ATMP is developed. An operator's interim operating authority or IOA is based on the number of tours it was conducting annually at the time the act was passed. An IOA does not set routes. It doesn't set operating conditions for an operator. Um, it only uh, limits the number of air tours the operator is permitted to fly each year. One air tour operator, Wright Brothers Aviation Incorporated, currently holds the IOA or interim operating authority for 76 annual flights at the park. Based on a three-year average of reporting data from 2017 to 2019, Wright Brothers conducts an average of 64 annual commercial tours at the park. Under our existing conditions, the annual number of commercial air tours at the park are limited by the IOA. Um, however, there aren't any designated parameters on the route, the time of day, or the altitude restrictions. Um, and to further protect our park resources or the visitor experience. Currently, there aren't any procedures in place which allow the park to establish a no-fly period, for example, for a special event or for some planned park management activity. And there isn't any currently any requirement that the operators have um, education or training for um, flying the operations over the park. There are provisions and conditions in the draft ATMP that address these parameters in a manner that we um, believe will protect our park resources and our visitor experience from the effect of the, any effect um, from the commercial air tours. And most importantly, support the NPS management objectives for the park. Next slide. This slide summarizes the um, the existing air tour conditions and the proposed ATMP. So the number of air tours authorized under the draft ATMP, um, as mentioned before, is 64 annual commercial air tours. And the altitudes for the proposal within the park, the air tours will fly no lower than 2,000 to 3,000 feet AGL or above ground level, depending on your location over the park. The type of aircraft is a fixed wing for both um, alternatives and the air tours may operate two hours before sunset sunrise, after sunrise, I'm sorry, until two hours before sunset. And that's um, as defined by NOAA or the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. The NPS can establish temporary no-fly periods that apply to air tours for special events or planned park management. In the absent um, any emergency circumstances or operations, the NPS will provide a minimum of 15 days written notice to the operator for any restrictions 
that temporarily restricts certain areas or certain times of day, or 60 days written notice to the operator in writing in advance of the no-fly period. And some examples of those types of events where we might do that, um, a good example is uh, a tribal ceremony, for example. Additional requirements under the draft ATMP include um, that operators will be required to submit to the FAA and the NPS semi-annual reports regarding the number of air tours that they've flown over the park. And when the park makes it available, the operators may take um, a training course that would be conducted by park staff uh, about park and park resources. And at the request of either of the agencies, the NPS or the FAA, the park staff and the local um, FAA Flight Standard District Office or FISDO and the operator may meet once a year to discuss the implementation of the plan. For situational awareness, when conducting tours over the park, the operator will be required to use the frequency 122.8 and report when they enter and depart a route over the park. Next slide. Why have we proposed these measures? Well, as I mentioned earlier, the pro provisions and conditions in this draft ATMP are designed to protect park resources and visitor experiences from the adverse effects of commercial air tours, and most importantly, to support our NPS management objectives for the park. Under NEPATMA, the FAA granted interim operating authority for air tours over the park. The interim operating authority does not provide any operating conditions such as routes, altitudes, or time of day for the air tours. And the only thing, as I mentioned earlier, is the annual limit on the tours. The total number of tours authorized under the draft ATMP is consistent with the existing air tours that are flying now over the park. And the annual flight limits in this draft plan are intended to protect the park soundscape, the experiences of our visitors, our wilderness character, and our wildlife by limiting the number of potential disturbances caused by the tours. The condition that commercial air tours may fly no lower than 2,000 to 3,000 feet above ground level, depending on location, is consistent with avoidance recommended for marble murelets and northern spotted owls. So noise from a fixed wing aircraft at 2000 feet AGL, and that's for a Cessna 206B 57.4 decibels um, at DB LMAX is the sound only injury threshold of 92 decibels for northern spotted owls. And additionally, this provision will improve preservation of our wilderness character and visitor experience by reducing the intensity of the noise to visitors who are on the ground. Operating tr operator training and education, of course, will facilitate the effective implementation of the air tour management plan by offering opportunities for the operator to remain informed and regarding the requirements of the ATMP. And the annual meeting will be used to review and discuss implementation of the plan and to ensure that the operators are aware of the terms and conditions. Thanks, Michelle. Great, thanks, Sarah. And I'll go ahead now and, and turn it over to the FAA. Thanks, Michelle. Thanks, Sarah. Uh, that was a wonderful and informative uh, presentation on the resources in the park and the uh, ATMP. Um, so developing this uh, draft air tour management plan is, is a federal action that, tri that triggers the requirements of the National Environmental Policy Act, or known as NEPA, and NEPA requires that the agencies consider the human and natural environment that could be affected by the action or the in the development of this air tour management plan. NEPA also requires that we determine the appropriate level of environmental review and prepare the associated environmental review documents. 
At this time, the FAA and NPS are considering developing this air tour management plan under an NPS categorical exclusion. Now, I think it's important to make clear that a categorical exclusion does not mean that this action is excluded from complying with the National Environmental Policy Act. Rather, a categorical exclusion is the type of action that has been determined to not have the potential to cause significant environmental impacts. Now, as the agencies go through our process, we will consider public comments on the air tour management plan, information obtained during the various consultations, including under the National Historic Preservation Act and the Endangered Species Act, and fully assess the environmental impacts before making a final decision on the appropriate level of environmental review. Next slide. Now, one of the other processes that was triggered was Section 106 of the National Historic Preservation Act, as this development of this air tour management plan is considered a federal undertaking. So under Section 106 of the National Historic Preservation Act, the FAA and the NPS are working to complete our consultation process that includes defining the undertaking and identifying the participants, determining the area of potential effects, or known as the APE, and identifying any historic properties within the APE, assessing the effects to these historic processes historic properties, excuse me, and to resolve any adverse effects, if any, to these historic properties. The Federal Aviation and the National Park Service have initiated consultation with the State Historic Preservation Officer, the SHPO, tribes, and other consulting parties. And I'll hand it over to Michelle, I believe, to discuss the Section 7 Endangered Species Act process. Great. Yep. Yeah, thanks, Eric. So the, the FAA and the National Park Service are complying with Section 7 of the Endangered Species Act, or ESA, as they develop the ATMP, and this ensures that the proposed action does not jeopardize the existence of any listed species under ESA or result in the destruction or adverse modification of designated critical habitat. The agencies have had informal comfort, informal consultation conversations with the Fish and Wildlife Service and the preliminary assessment by the agencies is not anticipating these types of impacts. Next slide, please. As noted earlier, we're currently inviting public comment uh, on the draft ATMP and we wanna hear from, from all of the public, the tribes, other agencies, all interested parties. And we, um, I noted this earlier, but we are asking for comments by August 28th, and I'll mention that date a couple more times. And comments can be submitted one of two ways, either online through the National Park Service public comment website, you'll see the link there on the slide, or by mail to the address also on the screen. And if for some reason during this meeting, you don't have a chance to write that down, that address is also included on the Pepsi website. The agencies um, I mentioned earlier too are, are not actually accepting comment uh, via email. I'd also like to point everyone's attention to the fact that there's an FAQ document that's posted on the public comment website alongside the draft ATMP. And if somebody from FAA could drop that link to the Pepsi page into the social media pl platforms, it'd be appreciated. Next slide, please. Following the end of the public comment period, the FAA and the National Park Service will review all of the public comments and use them to inform the final AT&P. They'll continue to coordinate and complete tribal 106 and section seven consultations, and they'll conclude the NEPA process by signing a decision document. And once all of that's wrapped up, the AT&P will be considered complete and it will be available on both the FAA and the National Park Service websites. FAA will then update the operation specifications for each air tour operator. Next slide, please. And with that, I'd like to say thank you to all of our presenters and we'll 
now turn over to the Q&A portion of our meeting. And for anybody that may have joined during the presentations, I'm Michelle Carter. I'm an environmental protection specialist with the National Park Service, and I'm serving as the moderator of the meeting this evening. If you have a question you wanna submit, you can post it um, into the Google form using the link that FAA shares in the chat area of whatever social media platform you're using. And as a reminder, all questions submitted through today's meeting will be considered by the agency as they continue drafting the ATMP, but they're not actually considered formal comments. Um, I said a bit ago, all formal comments must be submitted through that Pepsi site or sent to the mailing addresses, again, both displayed here on the slide. And here, my reminder is the August 28th is the date for public comments. You know, in the beginning of the meeting, we said it was going to be a 90 minute meeting and we'll adjourn at 7 p.m. Pacific time. In the event that we get through all of the questions um, and don't have anything coming in, we plan to keep the meeting open until 7 just to allow for additional questions as people have a chance to, to sit back and reflect and think about some of the stuff they may have heard during the presentations. So with that being said, Go over here to our list of questions and go ahead and start with a question for Eric with FAA. Um, what flights does this plan apply to and are military planes included? Thank you, Michelle, and thank you for the question. So this air tour management plan only applies to commercial air tours. And there is a, there's a, specific, a specific definition that's found in the FAA's regulations at 14 Code of Federal Regulations, section 136.33. And that definition allows for or defines a commercial air tour as any flight conducted for compensation or higher in a powered aircraft for sightseeing over a national park unit within one half mile outside the boundary of a unit of the national park system or over tribal lands during which the aircraft flies at or below a minimum altitude of 5,000 feet above ground level, except for takeoff or landing or as necessary for safe operation of the aircraft under FAA regulations. It has to be less than one mile or less than one mile laterally from any geographic feature within the park unless more than one half mile outside the park boundary. Commercial air tours do not include general aviation, commercial airline aircraft, or military flights. So that was a long way of saying it. No, the ATMP does not apply to military planes. So hopefully that responded to your question. Thank you. Great, thanks, Eric. And this next question will go to Vicki with the National Park Service. The question is, uh, why, why are you trying to introduce air tours into the park? Well, air tours are not new to Olympic National Park. Uh, they've been flying there since before the National Parks Air Tour Management Act was passed. And so when that act was passed, it did provide uh, for air tour operators to apply to the FAA to do air tours over a park. So that operator applied to do air tours over Olympic National Park and FAA granted the interim operating authority that they've continued to operate under since then. And uh, as we mentioned before, the, the interim operating authority doesn't set route or operating conditions. So what this air tour management plan is going to do is uh, establish those conditions for routes and altitudes, and also establish a limit on the number of air tours. And that average is, uh, or that's based on the average from 2017 to 2019, which is 64 tours per year. Um, that's what's being proposed in this draft ATMP. So that's a reduction over what the maximum allowed is currently. Uh, so, and that draft ATMP also, in, you know, includes provisions to protect cultural and natural resources and visitor experiences by, 
by specifying those routes, the altitudes, aircraft type, and time of day restrictions, and also restrictions for particular events. So without an ATMP, none of those conditions will be uh, put in place. Thank you for the question. Thank you, Vicki. So for the Q&A session, we're actually gonna have a couple of new faces come on, um, staff from Olympic National Park. And for this next question, I'd like to introduce Gerald Weaver, the, the Chief of Natural and Cultural Resources Management. Hi, Gerald. Uh, so the question is, uh, what, if any, wildlife expert or other scientific evidence do you have that the flights at 2,000 feet will not disturb nesting habitats of spotted owls or marbled murrelets or other creatures in the park? Well, I'll be the first to say that Sarah actually did a really good job of going over this already. So it bears repeating. So I'm just going to go over um, some of the information that Sarah has already shared with you. Uh, the condition that commercial air tours may fly no lower than 2,000 to 3,000 above ground level depends on location over the park and is consistent with avoidance recommendations for marble murrelets and northern spotted owls. Noise from a fixed wing aircraft at 2,000 feet above ground level. And that, that's basically a considering a Cessna 206B is 57.4 decibels. And that's below the sound only injury threshold of 92 decibels for northern spotted owls. Additionally, this provision will improve preservation of wilderness character and visitor experience on the ground by reducing the intensity of air noise to visitors on the ground. And I think uh, Christina has a little bit more information that she'd like to share because she's been in consultation with Fish and Wildlife. Christina, do you have some things to add? Yeah, I just want to add that this is a really great question. We've actually been working in often and always work closely with our Fish and Wildlife Service counterparts. And our point of contact, Bill Vogel, has already weighed in on this project and given us a preliminary effects determination um, concurrence of our effects determination of may affect, not likely to adversely affect, given the type of aircraft, the altitudes at which they're flying, and that um, the habitat for marble murrelets is below the 3,500 feet. And as Gerald said, the altitudes at which the aircraft would be flying would be relative to that during the nesting windows, um, along with those limited operating periods of when um, the, the flights can occur so as to avoid the, the feeding, the really important early morning and very late feeding times. So we already have preliminary concurrence from our um, ESA experts at the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service that um, agree that this is a may affect, not likely to adversely affect. And consultation is still um, in progress, and we will have that documentation um, closer to the end of um, this planning project before we can release the decision document. So thanks, Gerald. Thanks, Christina. Yeah. Great, thanks to you both. And um, I didn't get a chance to properly introduce Christina. Christina is the planning and compliance lead for Olympic. So thank you for coming on for that answer. And the next question that we have, I think we'll go to Eric with FAA. And the question is, if an amendment to the plan will be considered, if an air tour operator wants to increase flights or enter this market, will equal consideration be given to a park visitor who wants to who wants flights to decrease or cease? All right. So, so thank you for that question. Um, an air tour management plan may be amended at any time, but the the FAA and the NPS will we would jointly consider any request to amend an air tour management plan that we got from an interested party. And then we may initiate the amendment process uh, for our own reasons as well. So the park might have discovered some more information about some resource impacts. And, and so the park might initiate an amendment or FAA might become aware of some type of safety issue um, and might initiate an amendment. And then there might also be um, amendments that uh, outside stakeholders might try to want to initiate. Um, any request uh, would have to be made in writing and submitted to both agencies. And, and a request for an amendment 
would have to include a justification of, of how that amendment is consistent with the objectives of the air tour management plan with respect to protecting the park resources, tribal lands, or visitor use and enjoyment, as well as why it would not adversely affect aviation safety or the national aviation system. So there, there would be a process uh, the agencies will publish additional information for interested parties about the form and manner of submitting such a request. Uh, but it's in, you know, I do want to make clear that uh, any, any request, if an amendment was made, there would be a process. It would likely trigger NEPA uh, 106 endangered species, kind of similar process that we're undergoing now. So uh, I hope that answered the question. And thank you for your question. It's a great question. Yeah, thanks, Eric. Okay. So the next question, um, we'll, we'll start with Christina, and then if there's anything that Vicki may want to chime in, I think it might be good with Christina, though. Uh, the question is, is, are you planning to conduct a NEPA analysis of this plan? Great, thanks, Michelle. Um, so far, as, as Eric and Vicki have already mentioned, analysis has been conducted and we're considering using an MPS categorical exclusion. Um, that's section 3.3 categorical exclusion A1 in the MPS environmental policy handbook from 2015. Um, this, this categorical exclusion allows changes or amendments to an approved action um, when these changes would cause no or only minimal environmental impact. Um, so we are completing an analysis of effects, which is consistent with NEPA. Um, the type of documentation that's most appropriate to the analysis will be informed by the feedback that we received during this public review period on the draft ATMP and what we're presenting today. This will help us identify if there are additional effects that we've not yet identified or analyzed um, and that we do need to include within our review documentation and whether or not there's the potential for adverse impacts that, that would lead us into a different NEPA pathway. Um, in, in our handbook, we do have guidance in there um, called extraordinary circumstances that could, um, could um, actually cause us to depart from categorical exclusion and head into an environmental assessment um, if, if we determine that um, there are any kind of impacts or analyses that we've missed um, from the comments that we received from you guys that may be looking at increasing um, the, the or going up a level in the NEPA pathway. Um, I think, let's see, I do want to note one other thing is that um, I just want to re remind everyone that a categorical exclusion does not mean that this project is excluded from NEPA. Um, it, it's excluded from a preparing an environmental impact statement at this point. But again, based on the comments we receive, we may revisit the level of NEPA and move into the next category of NEPA if we determine that it is warranted. Thank you. I just wanted to add to Christina's very thorough answer that the uh, approved action that we're looking at for this air term under this under NAPATMA is the interim operating authority that was issued by FAA because that was uh, a requirement under the National Parks Air Term Management Act that FAA issued that IOA. So that that is the approved action we're we're looking at in terms of. The, the categorical exclusion. Thanks. And I appreciate that clarification, Vicki. All right, moving down. Um, I think we'll go back to you, Gerald. The, the next question is, um, have the potential increased air tour impacts been evaluated in light of increased Navy growler jet flights? You know, I've been seeing this question a lot in Pepsi. And let me just start off by saying that, that ATMP, the ATMP does not address military overflights. I know that's probably disappointing to many folks that we're not incorporating that in, into this plan, but that's a separate planning document. And I think many folks have probably been involved with, with the Navy at this point and, and their EIS. And so we're going to, Military airflights are not included. However, 
<laughs> existing noise from military overflights and activities are considered part of the existing conditions of the land landscape. Um, and so, as you can imagine, the number of air tours, 64, um, are, are not really centered or considered cumulative uh, impact of, of those air tours plus military overflights. Um, the impact of the ATMP are, are not significant. And I also should note that the air tours, 64 tours per year, is a reduction from 76 authorized in the, the interim operating authority. Um, and so in some ways, it's actually doing us a favor by reducing the number of flights. Anybody else got anything to add? Or I think that's it. I think that's good, Gerald. And, and for those of you that are, are watching online, as we provide responses, like if you need additional clarification, feel free to continue typing uh, clarifying questions into the chat and we'll be happy to, to do our best to make sure that we get to your questions. Um, okay, well, thanks, Gerald. And the next question, this next question will go, I think, to Eric with the FAA. And the, the question is, can you describe the tribal consultation you've done for this plan? Thanks, Michelle. Thanks for the question. Um, so in regards to tribal cons consultation, so Nepotma, so in accordance with Nepotma, any tribes whose land may be overflown by commercial air tours, <coughs> excuse me, have been invited to participate as cooperating agencies. Um, in addition, I'm aware that all tribes that attach religious or cultural significance to lands within the park have been invited to participate in consultation under Section 106 of the National Historic Preservation Act. The agencies definitely will consider tribal concerns in the development of the air tour management plan. And we encourage tribal members to review this ATMP and submit any comments or concerns that they may have. I think specifically, we know that on March 26, letters went to 13 tribes re requesting their participation as consulting parties. Uh, along with the Washington State Historic Preservation Officer. On March 29th, letters with the area of potential effect and historic property identification was sent to the Washington State Historic Preservation Officer and Olympic National Forest. And on July 30th, letters were sent to Port Angeles, Wright Brothers, the operator, um, Flattery Rocks, and uh, I hope I'm not messing this up too bad, Kiliute Needles National Wildlife Refuge. Uh, one letter was sent to both, uh, combining a request to consult with the area of potential effects determination and historic property identification table, as well as the route map. So we've been doing a lot of work on the tribal uh, consultation side. Uh, hopefully that was helpful and responsive. Thank you for the question. Anybody else want to chime in if they got it? I think I think you pretty much got it covered, Eric, unless there's other you know, questions that come in related to additional clarifying um, perspectives, but keep on going down here. Uh, we now have a question back to the park for Christina. The, the question is why, why isn't there a no flight option being offered? Great, thanks Michelle, it's a good question. Um, and I can understand why people would be confused as to why there's no flight option here, because usually when we go out for public review, we're usually having folks review an EA or an EIS in which folks are used to seeing a host of alternatives Alternatives, including a no action alternative or an alternative that would say no flights. But under CE level um, documentation in NEPA, we're not required um, to have a host of alternatives. And in this case, um, you, apl you apply not just in this case, but in, in any case, um, you know, a variety of CEs exist for um, actions that generally result in some level of environmental impact, but that don't have potential to cause significant adverse impacts under normal circumstances. And so given, um, I know Eric and Vicki had already talked about this too, and I talked about it in my last response, um, but the, the CE that we're 
we're using for this because we had an IOA for the operator um, and we were able to apply the CE regarding the, the changes or amendments to an approved action um, when such changes would cause no or only minimal environmental impact. So that's part of the reason why you don't see a no flights alternative. However, the other part of that too is that this is why we're here. This is why we're having this conversation or doing this presentation with the public. We encourage anyone who wants to see changes made to the draft ATMP to please submit your comments in Pepsi. Um, under the current interim operating authority, only one operator is, is allowed, is authorized to fly up to 76 commercial air tours per year over the park. And as Gerald just mentioned, that's going to be reduced with this um, plan in place. Uh, the ATMP, as I'm about to say here, the ATMP proposes reducing this to 64 annually with additional conditions that require flying specified routes, altitudes, aircraft type, day, um, time restrictions and restrictions for particular events. So the impacts that we're seeing uh, haven't really risen to the level of significance, especially when you consider, as we already talked about in another question that was being answered, the, the noise that we're experiencing from the growler overflights aside from the, the, the minimal amount of air tours that we're experiencing in the park. So again, under a CE, we're, we're, we're not required to examine a whole host of alternatives, but this is where you come in and um, please submit your comments, which many people already have, but please continue to submit your comments comments for what it is that you would like to see um, regarding the air tour management plan over Olympic. Thanks. Thank you, Christina. Um, so there's a question in here about updates on um, updates or new rules for flying drones. And the ATMP actually doesn't cover drones. Um, we just wanted to know the, the launching, landing, or operating any uh, unmanned aircraft from the national parks is prohibited. So um, I know that there has been some questions about that and you know, I'm sorry that that's not covered by this plan. Please keep your questions coming in here. Um, looks like we now have one for Vicki. The question is, uh, why is the Mount Rainier ATMP uh, why, why does the Mount Rainier ATMP restrict flights from 10 a.m. to 3 p.m., but the Olympic plan does not? Okay, thanks for that question. I will do my best to answer that. I'm looking at the draft Mount Rainier one and the draft Olympic one in front of me right now, so pardon me if I, if I look down briefly. Uh, the Mount Rainier draft ATMP is proposing one, one flight per year. That operator flies, it's actually the same operator, flies all the way to Mount Rainier. So by the time it gets there, it's, it's later in the day. So we, we did look at the information that the operator has reported over um, the last several years for Olympic and Mount Rainier and looked at the the time of the operations, and then also looked at the, the, the resource concerns for each park. And based on that uh, review, we, we just propose, we're proposing to use the current operating times for that e the operators doing at each park, which still meets and the protection uh, for the marble roulettes and, and the spotted owls. Uh, there's also uh, some additional information in there about if there's a quiet technology aircraft use that those would be um, provided for in another section and that would be, um, let's see here, let me see just a second here. In, the, in that case, they, the op, air tours may operate two hours after sunrise until two hours before sunset. Uh, we're not aware of this operator having quiet technology at this point, but that, that is one of the requirements in the patent that we include a quiet aircraft technology in the air tour management plan. And I hope that answers the question. Great, thanks, Vicki. Um, okay, this next question for, for Eric with FA. How are the routes and altitudes decided? Is this entirely driven by what the air tour operators want? Uh, 
Thank you for that question. So, so the routes and altitude information provided basically represents how the operators are currently conducting tours over Olympic. However, these uh, routes and altitudes have been reviewed by the park, um, FAA's Flight Standard District Office or for safety and are currently being shared with the tribes, the State Historic Preservation Officer, uh, consulting parties, U.S. Uh, Fish and Wildlife Service for their review, as well as, you know, during this, this public meeting. Um, and, and we are, you know, requesting, as others have said, input on, on the routes. Um, and please submit that, inf you know, your comments on it to the Pepsi site. Um, that's part of this process. So if you have any concerns, that's what this process is about. But that's how we got the information. That's what it is. Thank you. Great, thanks, Eric. Um, going now down a little bit to Vicki here on my screen. Um, the question is, does the NPS have the authority to ban commercial air tours? Yeah, thanks for that question. Uh, the NPS has the responsibility for conserving the scenery, natural uh, resources, and historic objects and wildlife in national parks and ensure that they remain impaired for the enjoyment of uh, future generations. And then FAA has sole authority to control airspace uh, over the U.S. So under the National Park Service Management Act, uh, we work um, cooperatively with the FAA and an air tour management plan may ban air tours in their entirety. Uh, that is a possible outcome of the process. It also may uh, ban air tours in part too, um, could be over portions of the park, probably times of year. Uh, those are things that I think we would envision as a partial ban. Um, and those air tour management plans are, are jointly developed by FAA and NPS. Thanks, Vicki. Okay, looks like we still, there's a couple more questions coming in. Um, we see some lots of typing. So I'm going to give us here a couple of minutes to, to let folks get their, their thoughts into the chat, into the Google form. Um, I'm gonna go off camera just for a second while we, give folks time to, to bring the questions in and we will be back here shortly.
Okay, so this question's for Christina at the park. Um, the carbon footprint from overflights has not been mentioned since zero emissions is a goal. How does the NPS justify any increase in carbon footprint in wilderness? Oh, great, thanks, Michelle. Um, good question. For Olympics specifically, um, we are actually not increasing the carbon footprint. As, as noted a few times in the presentation, we're actually decreasing the number of air tours that we're going to be allowing. So the carbon footprint would, would definitely increase. Um, you know, I, there, there may be other parks that are using helicopters as their air tours, but we're not doing that here. Um, however, you know, the pollutants that, that are regulated by the Environmental Protection Agency um, have, have been considered for each air tour management plan and a conservative approach was taken um, to estimate the highest total emissions possible per year. This was done by adding the emissions of every air tour plan and assuming those flights were all on the longest tour route. These annual estimates were then compared to the EPA's most stringent air quality thresholds to evaluate potential impact of air tours on local air quality. The emissions estimates um, for a worst case scenario were all well below these thresholds. In addition, since the aircraft are flying at 1,000, 1,500 feet above ground in some places, but here, 2,000 to 3,000 feet AGL, there's minimal risk of exposure to pollutants at the ground level. So hopefully that answers the question. Thanks. Thanks, Christina. Um, we have a question here that would be maybe best demonstrated if we have access to one of the previous slides. So, so Kate, would you be able to take us to slide 22, please? So we wanted to be able to bring up the map. Okay. Great. I, just, I, I think that a visual is actually better to address this question versus some of the text that we have. Um, so I, I just wanted to, to basically, so this is basically a figure eight, right? But it doesn't really go out to the coast. As you can see, um, it basically goes to the end of Lake Crescent, comes back up through the Solduck drainage, goes around Mount Olympus and then back to Port Angeles. Um, there, there will not be any routes out along the coast um, on this one. Um, and then in addition, let me see if I can pull up. And Gerald, I'm just, I'm, I apologize, like just yeah. to interrupt really quick. Uh, I just wanted to clarify for the audience that the, the question is about the wilderness beaches and if it's off limits to uh, air flights in Olympic National Park, or is it a matter of them just not being on the current flight path? And so- and I, I can address that as well in a little bit more detail. I just wanted to, to look at the visual number one to see, let, let them know that there are no flights along the beaches currently proposed. Um, the proposed annual flight limits routes minimum, added, minimum altitudes in this ATMP are intended to protect wilderness and visitor experiences by limiting the number of potential disturbances caused by commercial air tours, by providing opportunities for solitude and remoteness from sights and sounds the designated wilderness and by reducing the intensity of air tour noise at ground level. The hours of operation will provide quiet periods of day during which visitors can enjoy natural sounds and preserve opportunity for the solitude. And in addition, um, we, would, we would evaluate proposed new routes against that. Um, so so I, I think that that new routes would, would, would have like a filter of you know, what, what, how can we best protect wilderness and what are some of the values at risk for these new routes? And anybody else wants to chime in, they're welcome to. I, I think that covered it, Gerald, thank you. Yep. Um, okay, Kate, you can take us back to the question slide. I just like having that up in case, you know, people are popping off and they have access to the information on where comments can be submitted. So thanks for navigating that for us. Um, let's see, the next question will go to Eric. And the question is, if the plan's approved, what penalties will a flight operator incur if they violate the permit conditions?
Thank you. That's 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 a really good question. Um, so, um, any alleged violations of of this air tour management plan would be investigated by the Flight Standards District Office for that region. Uh, the FAA and the Park Service uh, would be responsible in general for overseeing compliance with the air tour management plan, but the FISDO would be the, the FISDO to Flight Set Standards uh, District Office would be the uh, line of business responsible for enforcement of any or investigating any alleged incidents of non-compliance and the penalties if you will would vary depending on the circumstances factors such as the severity of the issue whether or not there are repeat offenders etc and i think it's really important as was said earlier that you know this air tower management plan requires operators to have flight monitoring technology um, equipped on their aircraft and that would ensure that the agencies have really good data and inf information to follow up on any type of uh, incidents of non-compliance with the air tour management plan so thank you that was a great question hopefully that's responsive yeah thanks eric um, looks like people are busily typing, some questions are coming in. Um, so if folks um, just bear with us a few minutes while we have a time to um, let people finish typing here, um, we'll get to the rest of the questions. I just um, want to continue to encourage if, if you're out there online, like please submit the questions. The park, as you heard from Christina, like genuinely wants to hear from you. So. Uh, don't be shy about the questions you have and you want to ask. And um, if you'll give us a couple of minutes just to let the others that are out there finish typing their questions, we'll be back in just a minute or two with some answers.
Okay, uh, and the next question um, we'll, we'll give to Vicki. Um, the question is, what happens if an air tour management plan isn't done or if an air plan, air tour plan is not completed? Hey. Yeah, thanks for that question. That's a really good one. Uh, as we're continuing to work our way through air tour management plans, I think it is really important uh, for uh, people to know that uh, under the PATMA, we are required to do an air tour management plan or a voluntary agreement for any park with more than 50 tours per year, which is the case for Olympic National Park. If an air tour management plan is not completed or significantly delayed, in the current planning process that those parks uh, with more than 50 tours will continue to be out of compliance with the law. And, and then further, without an air tour management plan, the air tours uh, over the park can continue. They would continue under interim operating authority, which only sets the, the maximum number of flights per year. It doesn't uh, specify routes or altitudes or any other time of day restrictions or restrictions for uh, events. So without that ATMP, uh, there would be no improvements in the specific routes and the things that are, are would be put into place with a, an air tour management plan that are designed to protect the park natural and cultural resources, tribal values and visitor enjoyment. And so, and I can't remember if we've mentioned this previously, but when that air tour management plan is established, the interim operating authority is terminated and that operating authority that's uh, established in the air tour management plan is what becomes uh, the maximum number of flights. And without that plan, that interim operating authority continues. Okay, thanks for the question. Thank you, Vicki. Okay, um, the next question, go to Christina at the park. And the question is, uh, did the informal Fish and Wildlife Service assessment consider the compounding impacts of these flights, uh, the compounding impacts that these flights add to the already existing impacts of other flyovers like military flights or did it assess air tours in isolation? Sure, great question. Um, I, I just want folks to know that um, with every project that we do, we don't assess anything in isolation. Everything is assessed with direct, indirect, and cumulative impacts or trends. So um, we did assess this in regard to the military overflights, which um, actually, as we've talked about, um, you know, within a few comments here this evening already, um, pretty much drowns out any any um, small Cessna flying over, given that the, the, the decibels of a small Cessna are even lower than those of the threshold decibels for um, the marbled murrelets, um, but, but are still much less than the growler overflights. So the addition of, um, actually it's not even an addition, the reduction of the air tours within the park um, actually does not add add to any um, decrease in the trend. The noise from them are, is so much greater and, and really just drowns out so much when they're when they're flying over. So we absolutely have considered um, everything, we, we, we consider everything um, that may affect um, past, present, or future foreseeable actions um, that may affect any given uh, topic, project action, or how the action itself may in turn affect those impacts and, and um, cause greater impacts within the area. But for this project, we're, we're actually reducing the number of, of air tours and, and therefore even less so affecting the soundscape um, comparatively to the military overflights. I hope that answers the question. Thanks. Yeah, thank you, Christina. So right now it's about 
specific time. Um, we have about 10 more minutes to be taking questions. Um, it looks like we might have a little bit more, more typing happening. So um, please continue to submit. We're, we're here to answer the questions. Um, I apologize. I was just looking to make sure that it hadn't come through. So I'm going to give you guys a few minutes to, to keep putting stuff into the chat feature. And we'll be back on in a couple of minutes um, as questions come in. So thank you.
Okay, thank you for your patience with us. It looks like we just had one last question come in. Um, and I think we'll go ahead and, and turn it over yeah, to Christina, thanks. Um, so the question is, how can the NPS say there's no impairment to the wilderness experience when uh, we haven't seen any data yet um, and no analysis of air tours compared to current noise levels? Sure, thank you, Michelle. Um, so basically analysis has been, has been undertaken and, and as we mentioned previously, this has resulted in the, in the condition within the ATMP that commercial air tours may fly no lower than 2,000 to 3,000 feet AGL. Um, and this depends on the location over the park in order to be consistent with the avoidance recommendations for marble murelets and northern spotted owls. The draft ATMP has, has been prepared in full compliance with NEPA, um, you know, all the requirements that we that we have to meet for NEPA. And as noted, the agencies are considering complying with NEPA through the application of a CE. The agencies plan to release the final ATMP categorical exclusion to the public at the close of the process. But something else I want to I want to note here in particular, because you know, the question is, you know how can we see there's no impairment to the wilderness experience when there's no data? And, and we do have the data. And again, um, you know, we're, we're very much up against other noise intrusions that we're experiencing on a regular basis. Um, and, and I want to make note here too, and, and remind folks that earlier on in the presentation, and I think it was when Superintendent Krish Baum was giving her presentation that, you know, air tours have been conducted in Olympic National Park for at least the last 30 years. And in, in reviewing some of the earlier comments that had started coming in for this project, a lot of people had the misconception that this was a new a new experience that the park was going to be offering, that we are actually out here proposing something new and, and folks were really upset at how that was going to impact the noise um, of the soundscape, but um, we've actually been, these actually have been occurring for at least 30 years and there's been no impairment to the wilderness experience during that time. Again, we're talking about Cessna's very small number of air tours, you know, fixed wing aircraft. They're not helicopters. They're flying at um, specific levels above the park. And with the ATMP, we're reducing those flights. And I know I've said it several times and I'm saying it again, we are reducing the number of flights. So we're actually going to improve the wilderness character um, you know, of, of the area by reducing those flights. And again, I know it's not eliminating those flights, but send us your comments and, and we still have information for consideration before finalizing the plans. So um, I just wanted to make sure that folks understood that, that this isn't a new proposal, that this has been, that these have been going on and that we're looking to regulate them and reduce them so that we can um, better enhance um, wilderness character and the wilderness experience, at least try to reduce some of those intrusions um, that may be experienced aside from those, those growler overflights that greatly drown out almost everything else that we're experiencing out there. So um, thank you for the opportunity to answer this question. Um, I hope that I gave a thorough enough answer for folks to understand. <laughs> It was a helpful explanation, Christina, thank you. Uh, and with that, it looks like we're coming to the end of our time. Um, I'd like to turn it over just really quick to Sarah um, for a couple of closing remarks. Okay, um, thanks, Michelle. Just trying to make sure that I am on camera, but um, so I first just wanted to say thanks to the NPS team and the FAA team and, and the NPS Natural Sounds and Night Sky program for all their work. Um, I wanted to share the what I think is um, a great closing remark, and it comes from the final concluding paragraph. Uh, from UNESCO when they um, accepted Olympic National Park as a World Heritage Site. And they wrote in their evaluation, Olympic National Park is the best natural area in the entire Pacific Northwest with a spectacular coastline, scenic lakes, 
majestic mountains and glaciers and magnificent temperate rainforest. These outstanding examples of ongoing evolution and superlative natural phenomena, it is unmatched in the world. I'd like to thank everybody uh, for your participation this evening. I know that it is August and everyone is extremely busy. Um, these virtual formats are not conducive um, to free flow of communication sometimes, and I appreciate your patience. Your time is really valuable and your attention, and I have to say your extremely good questions um, are appreciated. Uh, these are your national parks. Olympic National Park is your national park and your care and involvement in these park issues is vital to the park's protection and enjoyment. Absolutely vital. Please remember to get your comments on the ATMP in by August 28th. Thank you for your attention and please have a safe and enjoyable evening. Thank you, Sarah. Um, I know that we're two minutes past, but I just wanted to take a quick opportunity to remind everyone that um, there is a FAQ document on the Pepsi site that we mentioned earlier. You'll see the link on the screen. It has a, a lot of good information, so please check that out. Um, it's on with the draft ATMP. And if I think we got through all of the questions, but if you had a question that was not answered during the presentation, you can email. Um, it's NS, NSD underscore overflights at nps.gov. And I'm gonna ask FAA to drop that into the chat so people can, can snatch that up. But again, if it's helpful, it's NS, NSD underscore overflights at nps.gov. And, and I know I've said this a couple of times earlier, but I just wanted to reiterate the comments that we're, we're taking need to be submitted either through that Pepsi site or mailed to the mailing address um, at the park, or I'm sorry, it's actually with the NSNSD team. Um, so either get it into Pepsi or send it in via email. And I want to thank you again for your participation um, on behalf of both the FAA and the National Park Service. We look forward to hearing from you. Hope you have a good rest of your evening. Take care.